You are listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. The following teaching was given by one of the missionaries that our church supports. Jesus has called the church to go into all the world and proclaim the good news, and our support for missions is an important part of fulfilling the Great Commission. We hope you enjoy this teaching and are encouraged to participate in the great task of taking the gospel to all people. Lee's going to go ahead and come forward. I'll introduce this as Lee Short. Gosh, I've known Lee, and we've been supporting him as a missionary pretty much the entire time I've been pastor now for over 25 years. And uh, Lee's originally from this area, and a little small world story, when I was in the Marine Corps, uh, I was asked to come preach at a church. I was not a pastor or anything, but uh, the pastor there at the time knew me and asked me to come preach, and it was a church that Lee had helped uh, and was a pastor of a few years before that down uh, in southern Georgia. And I did not know it when I went there to, uh, to preach there that morning, but in, of all the small world things, I had just moved in from Okinawa. <laughs> Lee had already taken off and gone down to Mexico, but I was at the same place where he had preached at a church for years there in southern Georgia. And uh, a number of us in the congregation were involved uh, a few years ago going down to Mexico. Gosh, it was a little over a decade ago. And we did a lot of sweating down there. <laughs> uh, it was very hot uh, in the area there in the, in the little town where Lee was at. And we were helping to build a ministry center. Uh, and have seen some of the places that he'll be talking about this morning, uh, Cardboardlandia. Uh, we were actually out there involved and ministering and laboring and working. Uh, I think I actually even preached out at the, at the congregation out there. And so uh, it's great to be able to partner with him. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Do you want to come up and stand up sure. here? And I'll give you a, a, a stand. And so if we can go ahead and welcome Lee uh, Short. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Are you turned on? Uh, yeah, I'm turned on. I'm always on. But I always tell, tell my wife I need to calm down and focus. <laughs> and it's so good just to be back and to hear history. Uh, that church Brett was talking about, I, I started that church back in 85. And, and then, uh, but anyway. But my, my roots come back to here before it was a church. Uh, meeting with the Parlettes back in 74. And I, I remember when Brett was a cadet <laughs> wearing his white uniform. And, and all the years, your faithfulness, uh, your commitment to the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, it's phenomenal. And I'm so thankful to be here. Um, one day, Jesus was standing at the lake of uh, Gennesaret, and the crowds were pushing on him, and he was teaching them the word of God. He got out, he saw two fishing boats, and he went over to one, uh, that, which was Simon's, and he got in the boat, and he told them uh, to push them off the shore. Simon and his uh, brother were uh, cleaning out the net. And, and then he got in one of the boats, pushed offshore. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put down your nets in the deep. And he said, Lord, we labored all night long and we didn't catch a thing. But because you're asking me, I will do it. And so they went out and, and, into the deep. And they caught so many fish that it was breaking their nets. And they called their partners to come out. And they brought another boat. And they filled the boat with fish to the point that the boats began to shrink. And when they caught such a large number of fish, and, and Peter saw all these things happen, and the boat sinking, he turned to Jesus, and he said, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And they were all amazed. They were um, at the catch. And, and they were all surprised, and they said to Jesus, uh, Jesus said to them, he said, from now on, you will catch men. 
you'll be fishers of men. And so from that day on, they pulled their boats up, left their nets, they left everything and followed him. They abandoned it all for the sake of the call. They had the same name, but this pastor, I worked with him when he was a young man 30 years ago. Living, he was living in the mountains of Hidalgo, and I would take our video Bible school into all these mountain villages, and just recently, they brought their network of churches into our group. Isn't that neat? How things just kind of come around over the years. <laughs> Start a church in South Georgia, and, and a young cadet is preaching in the pulpit, and here we are today, you, you live long enough, you outlive your enemies, and uh, <laughs> it's amazing what God can do, right? <laughs> but anyway, um, so it's been quite a journey. Uh, this past year, uh, with COVID and all, and I, I was making trips uh, into Mexico as I could, um, and even before I got vaccined, uh, the, the vaccination, uh, I, I was able to participate in four of our hot meal, we call them soup kitchens, but preparing hot meals where the families would come and they would uh, take back in bags or whatever utensils they brought that we would fill up for their family and they would feed their family. And just like Pastor Brett has been uh, incredibly proud of you all uh, for going into action during these times, I've also been incredibly proud of our pastors in the midst of a crisis, Amen. to see the church in action, Amen. being relevant to the needs. Wow. You know, the government can shut down churches. Disease can shut down the physical building. But you can't shut down the kingdom of God. Amen. The kingdom of God will go forth. Amen. Because he's a God of redemption and he's a God of life. And so, you know, I'd be down there and they'd shut down both states, Nayarit and Jalisco, and uh, uh, shut down everything, stores, restaurants, everything. And so there's nothing for me to do down there except catch COVID, so I'd come back home. <laughs> and uh, uh, our pastors uh, have, have taken resources. Some of them we have sent, sent others. Uh, ha have been able to uh, get a hold of certain food and uh, donations and different things, and just working, 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 meeting needs and helping people in their time of, uh, of desperation. Um, remember the story I was sharing with you? There was two boats and two fishermen, and they were cleaning the net. I, I, I want to share with you uh, a, a few things that have happened to me. I'm kind of an intuitive person. I, I drive left brain people crazy that are methodical. <laughs> I, I, I mean, you know, they just about have a nervous breakdown around me uh, because I'm intuitive and I'm kind of all over the place. And, 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 you know, God works, you know, he made us, you know. <laughs> it's his fault. <laughs> uh, but uh, he made us and he deals with us according to our nature many times. And I, I've lived a really crazy life, a very simple life. Uh, I don't have a five-year plan, ten-year plan. Uh, you know what? I, my plan is to hear the Father and do what He says. And um, one day, we were being called back to Mexico. Uh, we were we served there from. 88 to 94, raised our children there, and we were kicked out of the country due to religious persecution from the powers to be. We were given a short time to leave the country. And I came back, heartbreaking, defeated, built huge facilities for uh, video, for printing, and um, for our video Bible school. And, and, and God took us out of there, and he still did the work. But it was a very different way. And, and years later, uh, a, a pastor that I met in 87 over in Seaford, Delaware, who uh, was continued to support us through the years, went up to Chicago, he asked me if I would go to Mexico and uh, start a base in, 
in Puerto Vallarta area. And I said, no, Randy, I live in Houston, Texas, and I minister all around the world. Uh, at that time, 17 countries. Uh, and, and the Holy Spirit said, Lee, wrong answer. <laughs> See, back before we left in 1993, we took a truckload, a, a 15-passenger van, emptied out the seats, filled it with Gideon Bibles, took it to this developing resort of Puerto Vallarta. And I only spent one night there, and the Lord spoke to me specifically and said, one day your ministry will have a base in this place. Well, when Randy was asking us to go, and I told him no, our first six years, we had a really hard time. I was up against cartel, mafia figures uh, who had a class action lawsuit uh, against us, uh, 70 of our neighbors taking the land, you know, people were dying and all this thing, and and, you know, a story, I physically died, went into heaven, I was dead five minutes. My wife called me back, I was mad at her for a year. Um, had all kinds of things happen. And so when he asked me to go, and I told him no, and the Holy Spirit said, Lee, go back. Now you can imagine what my wife said, thought, when I said, Carol, God wants us to go back to Mexico. And I could go into details of the crisis don't have time for it. Her response, she said, I will pack everything and put them in boxes. And we returned to Mexico in 2006 to live. Getting there, I'm starting to travel around trying to shake the bushes and get some more support as our support died down. And and I stopped in Pensacola where I went to school, Bible school, and one of the missionaries who now a pastor at that, at that time, he left the mission field to the pastor, he's prophesying over me, and, and he's saying all the things he already knew about me, but God was giving me a vision, and I felt like saying, please, brother, please be quiet, you know, God's speaking. <laughs> God is a God of revelation. The, the word of God is alive. And, and he was speaking to me. And what I saw was a, a fishing boat, the bow of a fishing boat from the time of Christ in a fog with the, the, the nets and uh, 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 going into the fog and then disappearing. And this vision repeated over a dozen times. And then the last frame, the fog and the bow coming out and the, the nets and disappeared, and the last frame was this. I thought I saw the same fishing boat, but it was a fleet of fishing boats. I saw it from the side, and God promised me if I would go back to Mexico, I would see an impact across the nation. Nine years go by. My supporters are happy for the work that we were doing in, in the, um, uh, uh, the garbage, what we call it, the dump, the, uh, uh, you know, where they brought all the garbage and, and all that stuff. And, and they were pleased with the work in, that we were doing to help these poor children that didn't even have a bathroom, a place to go. They weren't even Mexican. They, were, they didn't have rights in Mexico, though they're Mexicans because they didn't have a birth certificate. We helped them get birth certificates. My supporters were happy with us feeding them, creating a school, educating them, getting them into public schools, changing the They were happy with all these things. Nine years of my life went by, and I, I wasn't happy. That's not what God told me. That's not what I signed up for. I'm either crazy I'm missing it, or God's playing some kind of trick with me. You give your life. Give your life away. Well, you all came and break, broke ground for us. Remember how muddy it was? <laughs> Just where you slept and how you got there, got in the trenches. Well, I was working on the third floor. My wife's saying, Lee, we don't have money for this. You know, Lee, how are we going to do this? 
And I said, honey, you pay the bills. Um, you know, somehow you figure it out. God told me to do it. He told me that we were going to have churches all over the republic and that they're going to come from the north and from the south and from the east and in the west where we are. And we're working on that and other people hearing about what we're doing, they're saying, so where are the churches? Well, once God showed me the person and that I was going to work with and we got incorporated, now we have churches all over the republic. God is faithful. God is faithful. That same time Randy came down to Guatemala, I was working there for six weeks, uh, taking our video Bible school, and he came to ask me to go to Mexico. Um, at that same time, I had a dream. And in this dream, I was on a Caribbean island, and there were these two Caribbean uh, guys of African descent with a boat on each side of them with a net between them. And they were cleaning the fish out of the net, speaking Spanish. And so when I woke up, I tried to deduct what in the world was I seeing, what was I dreaming, uh, is this valid, what's going on? Now, I worked the whole island of Cuba for years. And we're taking our video Bible school and lots of stories and adventures there. Um, and, and the main uh, race that is left in Cuba is uh, those of African descent. Most of the mestizos of uh, the European blood, a lot of them uh, were in Miami and uh, fled the country, a large percentage of them. And, but I knew it wasn't Cuba, and I knew it wasn't Belize. I've worked in Belize, and, and I was just thinking, where in the world is this place? And I, I deducted that it was the Dominican Republic. I never worked in the Dominican Republic, and because I was working internationally and I have friends that work internationally, um, the next week I could have been in the capital city preaching, but I didn't. Well, the years go by, like seven years. Now I have a grandson. Hey, grandsons are great, aren't they? <laughs> I have four grandchildren now. And uh, Diego Gabriel Moscoso, his father's from the Dominican Republic, and he has a, a cousin, you know, grown man, uh, that wanted me to get chairs and all for him, and uh, he went, he, he's an educator, and he went to work with children and, and wanted me to help him. And I'm sorry, I said, sorry, brother, I don't have the resources to buy your chairs. And, but I'm preaching in Delaware, Georgetown, Delaware, where I just came from. Did five services, and at one of the service, services, a contractor came up. And he said, God told me to uh, build a building for you. And I went and met with him, and he said it was 20 by 30, and I thanked him and all. I said, but did God really speak to you? He says, yeah, God spoke to me. I said, well, your building won't fit what God told me. I said, would you give me a 40 by 60 roof instead of a 20 by 30 building? I said, God told me I'm going to be feeding 300 children. Well, they came and... Uh, put up the 40 by 60. Today that building is 40, I'm talking about, well, okay, the pastor said, Lee, you don't get anything till you get the land. Next week, my wife um, put me on a plane and I, I'm in the Dominican Republic, first time, land in Santo Domingo, travel seven hours to the end of the island up against Haiti. Before we went into the town of Oviedo, they wanted to stop at a national park and we pulled in, and there at the lake was two fishermen, oh my God. two boats, oh and a net between them as they spoke Spanish and cleaning out their nets. Oh and I just went to double my knees and weep. Isn't God good? 
that he's a God of revelation. He's a God of promise. He's a God of fulfillment, even if we don't see it in our lifetime. The first day, I meet the governor of the province. Within two days, I met met the leader of the political party uh, that was in power. I I, um, I, I met the head of the Senate, uh, a congressman, and some of these are family members, uh, two municipal presidents, uh, which uh, a municipality is is sort of like a county where, where they have jurisdiction over other towns, the old Roman system, and five city councilmen. The second day I was there, I had a promissory note from the, the local mayor giving us the best piece of property for free on Main Street and the name of the Providence, right in the middle, at the end of the developed part of the town and into the new area, the highest piece of property that was reserved for the fire department was the property that we got. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? You know, it's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about a king. It's about a kingdom. And we have the privilege. We have the privilege to be about the king's business and carry out his mandate. COVID has changed all of our lives. We've all been affected. Our families have been affected. We've all suffered from one degree to another. In my personal case, we suffered a lot. My son, who was 42 years old, came down with sarcoma cancer. My wife called me out of Mexico, said our son has turned for the worse, and he needed attention day and night. And so the last weeks of his life, um, I cared for him night and day. And and was with him to the point that he went into heaven. And you know, an adult child, the years go by, I'm working, he's working. Uh, It was such a privilege just to serve my son again. He suffered a terrible death. The day that he was being wheeled into hospice, the hospital staff was crowded in his room There was the two doctors that were attending him at MD Anderson and the hospital staff, the administrator, uh, the social worker, the chaplain. And my son was telling them, the bed's outside. He said, God has been so good to me. He said, I have lived such a great life. And now I'm on to the greatest adventure of my life where the arm of God (laughs) is reaching down and going to take me home. At that time, Chucky Trill came in, dreadlocks down to his waist. Anybody heard about Chucky Trill? Uh, He recently uh, was murdered in Atlanta. Chucky came out of prison. His father's a famous rapper, ghetto boy, Scarface, city councilman in Houston. When he came out of prison, there was no one there to help him. He was living in his car. My son was there for him. Chucky came in. He busted out in tears like I saw so many men do that came in to see my son. And he ran out of the room. The champ chaplain's running after him. My son, getting ready to be being wheeled into hospice, said, Dad, would you go help Chucky? He's going through a terrible divorce. 
He said, Dad, Chucky needs you. My son died March 16th, 2020. We couldn't have his funeral until July 11th for the military graveyard to be open there in Houston. Uh, he was a Marine and, and served in the Army. My wife didn't want me to do my son's funeral, the entire thing. I organized it, I did his eulogy. She didn't want me to do the message. I honored that. Chucky heard his story again, and he said, you know, my, my son, two days before he died, he said, Dad, he was promoting Houston artists, rap singers. He had a program in England uh, on the Internet on Fridays. And he said, Dad, you know why I stopped promoting hip-hop, getting artists into local clubs? And I said, no, son. He said, because you challenged me about the fruit of my life. What am I giving my life to, my life force, my energies? And you challenged me to, to do good with my life. And because of that, I stopped promoting that hip-hop because there was nothing godly in it two days before he died. Touched so many lives. He loved people like me. But... We had other tragedies. My oldest daughter, her house burnt down. Her husband broke his leg, a terrible uh, fracture. and uh, Just one tragedy on top of another. But I want to tell you something. In the midst of it all, we all go through life. But there is something more important than life itself. And that is using your influence and using my influence to serve a greater purpose, to fulfill, that doing something that will make a difference in the destiny of so many other people. Something much greater than our personal tragedy and story. There's a good God who's working in the midst of all things for his glory. I want to share with you from one of my newsletters, and I have newsletters out there. We love to send our newsletters. It gives testimony and insight into the ongoing ministry. It's a way that we can communicate. And, you know, if you don't get our newsletter, I, um, inside there's an envelope and everything, and, and we can continue to have ongoing uh, input and communication. But here, as COVID is breaking out, once again, I'm so pleased with how hard our, our people are working. On the Dominican Republic, we are sending monthly aid to Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Right now, it's difficult. Heavy artillery is on the border uh, between Haiti and the Dominican Republic because uh, the Dominican doesn't want to be overrun with all the Haitians fleeing the country. But... I want to tell you about Mamosito. Him and his father, his aged father, uh, elderly father, live in just a little tiny shack, like a rundown garden shack that you may have in your yard. They have no furnishing, which is very typical of the people who live in these little shacks. He is a junk collector. He gets up at the crack of dawn and begins to go through uh, his little town, street by street, looking for anything that someone is throwing away. He makes an average of about $8 a week. In Ireland, things are expensive. If he gathers enough, then he gathers wood and builds a fire to cook. Many times these people are going two and three days without any food. They have no water. We dug a well. And people like Manuel, uh, they come 
to get water at our community church, our, our community center church. Water is almost a dollar for five gallons. It can really cut into their budget. And, you know, you hear the testimonies. He said, we are grateful to God. Thank you, Vita, for helping us during the pandemic. Now, that thank you comes all the way to here, to Bay Ridge, for helping to sustain this. Another couple, Juan and Maria, they have two teenage boys. They also live in a tiny uh, ramshack, no furnishings. The teenage boys, when there is opportunity, they sleep at neighbors' homes if there's any room on a bed. The family went three days without food uh, when we came to them. Before that, in order to buy some food, they had one little stove. They sold the stove to buy food. And so they were three days without food. Our youth were coming through with our care packages, uh, staples, and this is what, this is what uh, Juan said. Now lightness has returned to my heart, and I'm filled with immense joy. I give thanks to God for Vida International, who is always <laughs> helping the poor. It doesn't get any better. I have another story to tell you. I want to tell you about three little orphans. Wilmery, age eight. Yancy, age five. And Elmery, age two. They live with their grandmother in atrocious conditions. We've been giving them food, helping them all throughout this time. Their, their father passed away, a young man. And then after that, a few months later, their mother passed away. Now remember, Wilmarie's eight years old. Her mother, 22 years old, five months pregnant, died of malnourishment. They were grateful to receive the food, but one day she's calling our overseer, which is related to me through my grandson, Pedro Alberto Terrero Hernandez. We call him Henry. And he's cry she's crying, and she asked the local director there of the, that center if they would call Pastor Pedro. And this little eight-year-old girl is crying and crying. She goes, Pastor Pedro, she says, we sleep on the wet ground with my dog and his fleas and ticks cover me all night long and I am in torment. Please get me a bed. Well, Pastor Pedro got a frame um, uh, you know, a, a bed box, you get it off the ground, and mattress and a fan to keep the mosquitoes off. We can't imagine how this world is hurting. But we can take and get and meet, help meet basic needs, show the love of Christ, and help Him our Lord to expand his kingdom. In Haiti, now that's the Dominican Republic. If you look on Google Maps and you look at the Dominican Republic, you see a green nation. You go across the Haiti border and you look at Haiti and it's barren. They're suffering. I look at, we have a, a church over on a border town, Anse Apitre, we have 50 adults and 150 children. 
the, the bamboo hut is used for a school. We don't, we don't pay teacher salaries. I don't run the school. Um, but it's multi-use. And, and you could visibly see our children getting weaker as supplies are cut off and during this COVID time. Children whose parents cannot console them because they're hungry and those who are able, if they can just get a little sugar and mix it with water to try to calm their children down. But some don't even have that. One night, I'm having a dream and there's a little Haitian girl. And she's so kind and so sweet. She's saying, Pastor, I'm hungry. Oh, my, my, my email, I get a letter from Henry and Lee, we've run out. The children are hungry. Right now, the heavy artillery is on the border. And it's even harder, but we're still somehow, I don't ask a lot of questions, but we're still been get able to uh, provide food aid and feed the hungry. Like I said before, the methods, the strategy, that changes. How we do church, it's different in all different types of places. But the mission never <laughs> changes. It's all about not getting lost people saved. It's about making disciples to know the teachings that will transform lives by the Spirit of God, the living church. The thing, the thing I want to end with today is this. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your life in pursuits that leave out Christ and his kingdom. But rather, develop that relationship with your heavenly Father so that you could hear his voice and no matter how you're wired, Thank God you're not wired the way I am, most people. But however you're wired, whatever your spiritual gifts are, whatever your heart of passion is, whatever is your abilities or your personality or your life experiences, don't let it go to waste. Use your strength. Use your heart. Use your passion to further Christ and his kingdom. And in our frailty and in our humanity, we are sinners saved by God's grace, redeemed for the redemption of the world. The life is not about you and life is not about me. It's about the redemption of mankind. And thank God for the honor and the privilege that you and I have to participate for such a grand cause as that. Amen. Once again, thank you, Pastor Brett. And I'm going to turn it over. You, you didn't want me to go all day long and all night long. I was preaching in Guadalajara at one of our churches. And when I got done, nobody moved. Nobody said anything. They weren't asleep. I checked. <laughs> and I said, okay, pastor, what do you want me to do? You want me to preach another message? He said, yeah, preach another message. Amen. So I went another hour. Amen. We already worshiped for two hours. And um, so I preached another message. They're just sitting there, didn't fall asleep. <laughs> and I said, what do you want me to do? <laughs> you want me to preach again? <laughs> They said, no, nah, we're, we're done. <laughs>
now it's time to pray for us all. But anyway, Pastor Brett, let me give this back to you because I know people are going to want to eat. Thank you for allowing me to come. God bless. Um, our missions team is going to uh, come up now. And for those who don't know, again, if you're a little bit uh, newer here at the congregation, where's David? Oh, there he is. Uh, I did, sorry, you were hiding. Uh, David and Melissa and Jason and Lisa and Tanya all help oversee the missions work here at our congregation. And so uh, they're going to go ahead and pray for Lee. The, the folks have been around for a long time. Now, we used to bring the whole congregation forward. It's a little bit unwieldy to do that now. But uh, we're going to pray, and we want to encourage you to uh, join in in prayer. And I want to remind you just of two things. Again, uh, number one, prayer is so important. We are engaged in God's worldwide mission each and every day. I, we, we encourage here, you know, this whole month we're focusing on what's going on, all the things that we were uh, just hearing about from Lee. I want to encourage you, every day you can engage in mission by joining in prayer. God hears, and it's not restricted to our lives. I think one of the reasons a lot of Christians struggle with prayer is our prayers are so self-focused. That gets very boring very quick. But if you open your eyes, there is a worldwide mission going on. So number one, pray. Also want to remind you that you can give. Uh, again, you can do it online. You can give out here. Everything is going on to give into these very things that Lee's talking about. I, I want to remind you, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. Look, there's a lot of things that our country is struggling through and we're walking through, but folks, you hit the jackpot when you were born here. If you've ever been around the world, <laughs> we hit the jackpot because there is poverty and, and disease and struggle and in many places, lack of access to the gospel. And we have the privilege of sowing into that. So I want to encourage you Let's engage in the mission, not only by our prayers, but also by our gifts. Father, as a congregation, we come to you and we pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Lord God, we pray first off for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit across these lands and places where Lee is working. Lord, we, we heard today about both spiritual and physical poverty. And Father, the two so often go together. Uh, Jesus, you said that you were anointed with the Spirit of the Lord to proclaim good news to the poor. And Lord, you told us that that was both physically poor and the poor in spirit. Father, they have gone together. And so we pray, Lord God, that your Spirit would come and you would break poverty in these places, O oh God. Father, both the poverty of hearing the word of the Lord and a poverty, O oh God, of just financial and physical resources, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit would transform, that your Spirit would change these very places. Father, I thank you for places where it has been seen, Lord, that as the gospel broke in, there were changes not only in the lives of people spiritually, but also physically. We pray that would be true across Mexico, across the Dominican Republic, Lord, that it would break through into Haiti. Father, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus, you came that we would have life, abundant life. So Father, we pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit in these places. Lord, we pray for the outpouring of the Spirit upon Lee and the other leaders in these various churches and ministries, Lord God. Father, we pray that you would prosper them, that you would multiply them, that you would use their labors to see many people drawn into the kingdom. Lord God, I pray that there would be even more needs for congregations to be raised up as more people were turning to you. Uh, Lord, we read in the scripture again that the poor received you gladly. I pray, Father, that this very day, as uh, churches are gathering and meeting, Lord, down there, I think of the, of the dump there in Puerto Vallarta, Lord. It was crushing, grinding poverty but there were people who had found true life. Father, I pray that your spirit would reach out, that you would draw more in, that you would give them hope and a, a future, Lord God. You promised good things, Father, even to the exiles, Lord, who had lost everything 
You said that you had a prom- uh, a promise for them, and you had a plan for them, and that plan was shalom. So, Father, we pray that that would break through, Lord, that as Lee and Carol and the others minister, Lord God, that you would be pleased to spread that shalom. And, Father, I pray as well for the future. Lord, as Lee mentioned, that the, the young man he had worked with years ago, Lord, has now uh, seen these other churches raised up and has become part of it. Father, we pray into the future. Jesus, should you tarry long after Lee and Carol are standing face-to-face with you, long after those of us in this room are face-to-face with you, we pray that the work of Vita International would continue, that it would go on, that it would prosper, that the gospel would continue to go forth, that more and more people would be drawn into the kingdom, would be discipled, would be sent out on mission to share the good news of the kingdom of God. Father, we are grateful to be able to be part of this. Lord, we pray that you would hear our prayers, that you would take the gifts, that you would multiply them. Lord, that others might know you, that they would come in and worship, give you the worship and praise and honor that you are due. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. I'm going to conclude with a word of benediction out of one of my favorite psalms. This is Psalm 67. And I encourage you to receive the, uh, the blessing of God. And again, notice the psalm begins with the words of the famous benediction that God said Aaron was to speak over the people. But I want you to notice the purpose and the reason. And you'll understand this is why we are blessed to be a blessing. Brothers and sisters, may God be gracious to us and make his face shine upon us so that his name would be known on earth, his salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy because you rule the people with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. Brothers and sisters, you are blessed. Go forth and be a blessing. In the name of Jesus. Amen. For more teachings and resources, or to learn more about the mission's work that Bay Ridge supports, please go to www.brcc.church.